the fistula there was complete stenosis, so a catheter could not be passed. Yeah. Can we get to the next slide, please? Sure. So this 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 is how the child was actually born. It's not a stretcher from any cause or any catheterization. So you can see from the film that the the MCUG shows a rather uh, big bladder with uh, outportions at the dome. The posterior urethra seems tortuous and dilated. It ends around somewhere in the prosma bulba urethra. And then you have a streak of contrast flow through the Prosma bulba, mid bulba, towards the uh, pina urethra. But that was a very tiny streak. And then beyond that tiny streak, you see that it's blown up. It's blown up. And then you can see a flux of contrast around where they created the urethrostomy. So that was an artificial, uh, artificial fistula. The patient wasn't born with it. Let's go to the next slide, please. I just have a quick question. Was this, so this um, study was done, was this done through the suprapubic tube right yes. here? Is that what we're, okay. okay. That's right. That's right. Because that child could not even be catheterized in the first place from the mutants. So, so Dr. Adai, I was, I just had a couple questions about this. Um, we can go back one slide if you don't mind. That's right. Perfect. So um, this is really interesting because when we think mm. of causes of congenital urethral strictures, there, there's only a few. Um, so Urethral atresia is the first thing that comes to mind with a long segment like this, but this child would not have lived and made it to the age of four. So I, I don't think that that's what's going on. Um, and then the next thing that we think of is, is this posterior urethral valves that we're missing. And the, the prosthetic urethra is very, very tortuous as a result. Um, so I wonder, did anybody have the chance to scope this child? We haven't scoped the child yet. The pediatric. We haven't been able to scope this child yet, please. Yeah, so the... this would be a great candidate for cystoscopy since there's a very sharp transition point. So um, this is what you'll see on an antegrade study, right? When the child is voiding you'll have that dilated posterior urethra and then it'll taper off and the entire rest of the urethra will have a very fine or thin stream of urine with hmm. children with posterior urethral valves. So it could look like a stricture, even though it's not. Okay, okay. Danielle, did you have any other thoughts? No, I mean, I think that's, um, you know, considering that it, it, you made a great point there, you know, considering this child's age at presentation of four, um, I agree if this was urethral atresia, you know, congenitally, um, these children, you know, they, they do not make it beyond, they, they just don't make it beyond infancy. Um, so, you know, the fact that this child is four, four years old, is that correct? Is that... That's right. Okay. Um, and I guess the question would be is how did the parents report his voiding um, prior to this? Did they, were they able to see urine coming out of the urethra? Did he, how did he void? Um, so this child was first seen by the pediatric uh, surgery team. Mm -hmm. My team from birth, so we came in, and we came in essentially because they could not pass a catheter when uh, they were doing the sap. I suspect this child may have had uh, a rectal uh, 
uh, urethral fistula, mm -hmm. a possibility. Um, again, I also suspect that this child may have had a suprapubic catheter placed in right from birth. It's very possible. I, I'm wondering why I, I should have even brought the pediatric surgeon who saw this patient at first onto the platform for this very discussion, but he, he's, he, he, he's traveled at the moment and could not join us. Um, I really don't have much information concerning uh, the period proud to the four years when I saw him. Mm -hmm. I saw him, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Okay. Um, I may have to get further information from the pediatric uh, team, uh, whilst the discussion is ongoing, I may want to try and put him on board so that he can help us clarify a few issues, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. Right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just give him a call and put him on, the, on for him to clarify a few issues for us here. Yeah. Okay, and while we wait, we can kind of go through the rest of the, um, just rest of the, we can kind of talk through it a little bit and then he can come back and maybe fill in some more of those details for us. Thank you. Well, Dr. I, I guess, well, Dr. Adai is, is, is calling his colleague. Was, was anyone else involved in this case that could maybe um, talk about uh, this portion um, when, when urology was involved? Was anyone else involved with this? I guess um, while we're waiting to hear from Dr. Adai, I, I can certainly add in terms of urethral anomalies that are reported with imperforate anus, it's not outside the realm of possibility to have posterior urethral valves. I've seen four or five children with both. It's not one of the classic associations, but it's certainly a possibility. And then the other thing to consider is urethral duplication, um, which could certainly have a very stenotic um, dorsal urethra. So if, if we were, kind of not recognizing a hypospadiac urethra, which can be as far back as the uh, anus itself, or even inserting into the anus or the rectum, a dorsal urethra can be, it can look like urethral atresia. It can look like a congenital urethral stricture. And Dr. Adai is correct. You can actually be voiding um, primarily through your rectourethral fistula. Um, so that has been reported as well. And that would be a tough one to figure out if you weren't a pediatric urologist involved at the time of the peace arp. <laughs> and then was it, I, I know we're still getting some details about, you know, his, his past medical history, but um, at least when, when he presented at this point in time, did he have any renal insufficiency, um, any, any problems with, um, just failure to thrive, um, any, any issues of that? Okay, well, maybe while Dr. Dai um, um, calls his colleague, do we maybe want to go on to the next case? Um, I, I believe, Patrick, are, are you able to present the next one? Is that someone that you were involved yes, with? Yes, yes. Okay, okay, let me let me just flip through the slides. Yes, it's, it's one that I'm... Okay, let's see. Okay. You wanna tell us about the patient with prune belly? Uh, yes, so, uh, well, I, I don't know whether the picture I had was uh, sent to you, uh, mm -hmm. but I, if I can be permitted to share my slide. 
Absolutely. Then there is a picture on my laptop that I would like to show. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. You can go ahead and share your, your screen. Okay. Please, can you see now? Is this sharing? Not yet. Try. No, there not you go. Yet. I think we can see it now. Yes, yep. We can see now. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So this this is a, I think now nine months old baby boy uh, born with prune belly syndrome. And uh, the mother came to see me in the consulting room at about. Uh, maybe seven months old. And this is the problem the boy has. Um, he doesn't have very obvious lax abdomen. He, he has, uh, of course, undescended testis, and they are both in the abdomen uh, picked up on ultrasound. The kidneys are quite okay. He doesn't have any serious problems with the bladder. But the main problem is with the external genitalia. And when you look at it, it is just a, a bag of skin. And on the dorsal aspect, mm -hmm. you can feel something that is like a copra cavernosum, but quite hypoplastic. Otherwise, it is just this bag. And when he wants to uh, you find that the bag will balloon and urine will come out from a very small opening at the tip of the, of the, of the phallus or of this penis, something that should be like the meatus. It's quite a small opening, but at least he manages to void quite well the skin of the sterna genitalia will also balloon and the receiving and a, a small opening where there is a leak of urine on the ventral side, apart from one which is at the tip, which I suspect should have. So it's, and uh, I thought that this was a megalourethra and uh, probably ain't because they want something to be done to fix this external genitalia, uh, but, Reading around, mm. I cannot really find anything meaningful that can be done. And so I thought that I should seek opinion from other people to see if there is any help at all for this little baby. So otherwise, um, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Janelle, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. Right. Oh, I was saying, and you were saying, so um, in this child does not have the, sort of the typical prune belly appearance in the abdomen? Can you guys can you guys hear me? I I can. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. The Perfect. abdomen you see, but it's not too too obvious. I mean, okay. The abdomen is a little lax, but it is not so so diffuse. It is not a the very, very terrible. type. Got it. Okay. okay. And then, yeah. um, um, okay. okay. By feel of failure. On the dorsal aspect, you can feel something firm, which I suspect mm -hmm. is a hypoplastic uh, corpora of the cavernosum. But mm -hmm. uh, I don't think he has any corporal spongiosum. He doesn't have anything. And uh, okay. this is all that there is. Okay. Yeah. And then any other, any other health With concerns? With undescended testes. No, okay, apart from this, function. it's quite well. Okay. Kidney function is good. Uh, there is no evidence. Yes, he, he has no uh, urethral, uh, sorry, ureteral anomalies. Uh, the kidneys are okay. Of course, the bladder is thick-walled, but the bladder mm -hmm. is okay. And uh, 
There is no hydrouretes, no hydronephrosis. He's quite good. Normal kidney function, very active young boy. Uh, I think apart from this and the undescended testis, uh, then he didn't really have much problem. Okay. Yeah, yeah. so he's, he's very lucky that he appears to be a good prune. Um, if he does not have hydroureter yeah. or hydronephrosis or renal dysplasia, um, no. The more severe prune belly children have such severe renal dysplasia and reflux nephropathy that they don't make very much urine in utero and even have pulmonary hypoplasia. The less severe ones are like what you are describing with more genital anomalies, but their bladders seem to empty well. They don't yeah. have hydroureter. So I would. I would still follow this baby for kidney function and bladder emptying because bladder emptying is the main concern um, with prune belly syndrome. We, we know that the mesenchyme doesn't okay. develop normally for the abdominal wall and typically also for the bladder. Um, now that if this is really just a genital anomaly, it's challenging because you have to set parental expectations that his his penis may or may not work as well as the average boy but usually doesn't work as well um, so corpus fungiosum is absent whenever you have a megalourethra that is correct and then corpus cavernosum that is variable it sounds like you feel some, so he would fit into the category of scaphoid megalourethra um, instead of fusiform, which has no corpora cavernosa. So can you guys see this? Can you guys see the, I, I put up the scaphoid megalourethra slide. Can you see that? No. No, okay, hold on. Wait. Let me pull that up. I didn't. There we go. Can you see that now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Mm. Perfect. So, okay. um, so your child would have more like a urethral diverticulum, it seems. Um, the urethra is very overdeveloped because there's no corpus fungiosum around it. But um, on picture B, you can kind of see the Corpora cavernosa, that, that narrow strip of it. Now you wouldn't see any of that if you did a retrograde urethrogram or cystoscopy in fusiform. So you wouldn't see that kind of good glands with the, um, the corporal body backing that diverticulum. So, I mean, classically, how we manage them, we don't usually reconstruct the urethra. We do typically do a circumcision, and that's to reduce the risk of UTIs from urine stasis. Um, some people will do a vertical reduction urethroplasty if this becomes an issue with dribbling after potty training or recurrent UTIs but you're never going to make this penis look totally normal. Danielle, do you want to add anything? No, I, I think that's exactly it. I mean, I think they're very, very challenging to reconstruct just because you don't have, um, you know, good corp like corporal bodies as, as sort of a backbone structure to do your reconstructive um, procedure on. Um, and I, you know, oftentimes I think if you try to reduce um, the the dilation, it's it's just going to recur again. Um, and so sometimes going in to reconstruct these actually can make the problem worse. You end up with a, a sort of a bigger bigger mess on your hands than if you just leave the child alone, particularly if they're not having urinary tract infections or. Um, you know, anything that's really um, causing a, a big, you know, functional issue. 
um, a lot of these boys too over time will learn to, you know, kind of instruct them to sort of milk the urethra to make sure you're not getting stasis of urine in there after they void. They kind of learn that as part of their voiding technique as well. Yeah, so we put them on a timed regimen. They pee every two hours once they potty train. They try to pee twice and they milk their urethra, just like Dr. Sweeney said. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. So I, I guess then uh, I just have to keep talking to the family because they are anxious to see something done about the penis. And mm -hmm. so when I talk to them, they don't seem to be uh, too happy with um, having to keep the boy um, with this type of um, abnormally of the external genitalia. But uh, I think I will continue to talk to them. Hopefully, if you should come around next year, I will bring him around so that you also have a look and we see if there is something that can be done for him. Yeah. So does does his exam when you examine him does it look similar to picture B? Like when do you, have you um, have you filled up his urethra in a retrograde uh, sort no, of like with A? No. Have you, picture, no. picture B. Picture B is. I think his looks worse compared Work. to picture B, because okay. if you look at picture B, you can see even the glands. Uh, mm -hmm. You can see some parts of. The, of the shaft too. Mm -hmm. Does he have a but normal appearing gland? Yes, it's not so. Mm -hmm. It is just a bag of skin. It is just a, a bag of skin which transmits urine. Just that. Okay. Th there is nothing fair to feel and nothing okay. to see like you see here as glands. I will say that it is just something like uh, the foreskin. Mm -hmm. without any corporal tissues in it, that is transmitting urine, just that. Uh -huh. But the only firm structure is a very soft, sorry, a very thin, uh, firm, something you can feel on the uh, dorsal aspect that I suppose to be sacra cavernosa. Mm -hmm. Because according to the, he has seen that thing erect a bit mm -hmm. uh, at a point, mm -hmm. but then all of that is enveloped in this huge sack of skin, um, which is transmitting urine, just that. Okay, and have you been able to, are you able to pull back the foreskin at all? Like, are you able to visualize a, a meatus? You, 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 you cannot, you, you can't. You can't, There okay. is nothing to see, yes. Okay. On the distal yeah. aspects, there is nothing to feel. It is all mm. just the skin. Yeah. Well, so um, he will he will have a glands. It's just it might look very narrow and tiny once you take the foreskin mm. down. There will be one. So kiddos with prune belly can be circumcised, but many times, and I have a, a child. Um, that I'm following with the same, they have this really skinny, narrow, almost pencil tip glands, which is okay. consistent with the fact they did not have a uh, formation of the, the corpus spongiosum, right? That's why they get such saccular dilation of the urethra. It's not bound by the corpus spongiosum, yes. so it turns into a diverticulum. So anytime you reduce that, if they they have no backing, so it'll just recur, as Daniel just said. Recur. It'll just recur. And you're never going to make this penis look like a normal man's penis. penis. And his erectile function may not be very good with that little corpora. So yeah. this is a good time to set expectations. But the testicles are in the abdomen, too, which is, that's a significant concern. Um, we do typically do bilateral orchiopexies for these boys and circumcisions at the same time. So if they are interested in that, that might be something to offer. To offer him. Yeah, that, that is yeah. what I want the patient, sorry, the parents to accept. That's as uh, it is now, probably 
what is important is to try and get orchidopexis done and not really uh, sure now the approach to circumcision in these is pretty easy um you kind of just do a dorsal slit and then That's put pins. clamps but around they the side. are more interested in this and uh, okay. okay yeah All right. I think it will be good to get uh, the IVU med team to have a look at this child. So Absolutely. probably we will try to do that. I will arrange for that to be done. If hopefully you are able to visit next year. Yes, for sure. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Okay. And then but, I guess- Dr. Uh, is back. Okay. You want to go back to that first patient? Uh, we can finish with this very one, the uh, prone belly syndrome, and then we can go back to the yes. first one. Oh, okay. Um, uh, Dr. I think I think we are done with it. I don't know, unless Dr. Fox wants to do something more. I, uh, I, I thought I saw Dr. Fox. Had, on him. I thought Dr. Fox had some literature on the prone oh, okay. belly syndrome. Okay. Here, I can pull up the slides for her. There we go. Sure, yeah, we can review that. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the two types of megalourethra are scaphoid and fusiform. So the, the scaphoid is the one where you can feel that corpus cavernosum. The fusiform, it does not have any. And that has implications with respect to erectile function down the road. So many times with the scaphoid, parents will report some erections, but with fusiform, they typically don't. And those boys go on to need penile prostheses in order to be sexually active. But you can't really tell the difference between the two by looking at the degree of urethral dilation or the glands itself. I'll take next slide. So we, we went over scaphoid. Now this is just going over a reduction urethroplasty. So there are some where it's done vertically. And again, the concern is that it's basically like reducing a urethral diverticulum, but unless you have some sort of muscular overlay you can put there, it will recur. Um, next slide. And then with the fusiform, 100% of these babies, they have associated syndromes. Um, they have multiple anomalies and they are often associated with pulmonary dysplasia and the more severe presentations, which is why we probably don't see them as much as we see scaphoid megalourethra. Next slide. Um, so the, when you're approaching a prune belly child, um, I think you know, you've already gone over all the things that you were looking for and worried about, but prune belly itself has absent abdominal wall musculature, yet you can absolutely have a spectrum of this. So some children just look like they have a really big chubby belly. Um, it's really more prominent when their bladder is drained. So if you put a bladder catheter in, you might start to see those wrinkles. Whereas if you don't have a bladder catheter in and their bladder is large and full, their bladder can distend the abdomen and they can just look like they have a full belly. Um, and then megalourethra typically goes along with prune belly, but again, some of them are mild, some are more severe. They always have undescended testicles and they're usually inside the abdomen. Um, they usually have significant infertility, and that would go along with having bilateral undescended testes. Um, but there's probably even more than that in terms of a mesenchymal or a mesodermal defect during development of the testis. Now, erectile dysfunction is pretty, pretty common, common, but it's 100% with fusiform megalourethra. Most will have some degree of megacystis and megaureter. Um, and vesicoureteral reflux. It's pretty uncommon to have concurrent UPJ obstructions or UVJ obstructions, but if you saw absolutely massive 
um, hydroureter, you would certainly want to rule that out. You would want to do a VCUG. It's always a little bit hard in these kids to not intervene when you see big, huge ureters and a big, huge bladder. But um, because they don't efficiently empty, we really try to avoid putting them on catheterization or catheterizing them repeatedly because we will colonize their bladder. Um, and that's part of the challenge in these kids is making sure they're emptying well enough to not impact their kidney function. So once they're potty trained, we will have them void twice, void often, milk the penis. Um, it's a pretty rare kid that we're gonna recommend a vesicostomy or an appendicovesicostomy for. Those are usually the ones that are getting febrile UTIs. And then ureteral reimplantation is sometimes needed. Uh, next. So I think we went over the bladder considerations, but when, when to intervene. So if they're emptying well, and it's a seven month old baby that's doing great, like your baby without hydronephrosis, we're not going to do anything to their bladder. But if they're getting febrile UTIs, that's typically when you'll do the ureteral reimplantation. So obviously after usually after a year of age, but these are pretty big bladders. Um, and then if their kidney function is worsening and their emptying is worsening, you may have to think about a vesicostomy or an appendicovesicostomy. Uh, next slide. So there's lots of stuff in the literature about prune belly syndrome. So there's the Monfort abdominoplasty where you take a, um, an almond shaped wedge out of the abdominal wall and then reduce it. A reduction cystoplasty is the same kind of concept. You just lop the top off the bladder and close it. Um, it's the same principle with the urethra in terms of reducing it. But again, the problem is the muscular backing. So if you don't have muscular backing and you take a viscous structure, that viscous structure will simply re-stretch. And that's what happens after abdominoplasty and reduction cystoplasty and urethroplasty. Um, but the things that we do need to do for them that are consensus are orchiopexy. Um, and then if they are having a declining kidney function or um, febrile UTIs, ureteral reimplantation and possibly diversion. So those are the consensus items. Danielle, anything to add? No, I think that's a pretty thorough overview. Now, how, um, what was your plan for taking care of the um, orchid apexy? Well, yes. So, um, fortunately, the ultrasound scans he did said there were very small testes in the abdomen, mm -hmm. um, smaller mm -hmm. than the usual size. I am I've forgotten exactly what was quoted, but I think they said a, a zero point. I do a less than one mil volume each, mm -hmm. but that was on mm -hmm. ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I would have preferred if we could do laparoscopy to see if we would visualize these testes uh, before we do the orchidopexy. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the absence of laparoscopy, I asked the parents if they wouldn't mind that we do an exploration of the abdomen uh, to see if, if we, we would find the testes and then get orchidopexy done. Um, I saw them when the child was around seven months that went from, from the time I saw the uh, penis corrected. I was going to have done an open orchidopexy in the absence of laparoscopy, uh, hoping that uh, if the ultrasound is right, that very small testis, I would be able to see it. <laughs> and try to fix it if possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, are you doing, are, are you doing a lot of, um, 
are you able to do lap cases at your hospital on, on infants? Or, Unfortunately, or no? no. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's yes. like, okay. Unfortunately, okay. no. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, oh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Okay. I say, you know, doing doing laparoscopy on on prim kids is is you know there's always just some more challenging things you have to think about, um, you know, particularly just getting access into the abdomen because of the very large yeah. bladder. Um, you know, I, I know the first time I I did a lap case on a, a prune belly, um, you know, our care report was actually in the bladder. You know, it's just it was just such a large it was just so large to try to work around that. So those are always considerations, but. In this case, certainly not having laparoscopy um, as an option to treat the testicles, um, you know, I, in, in, an abdominal exploration is is really warranted. Um, you know, I, I think that's an important thing to get the testes out of the abdomen. Um, you know, for obviously for cancer reasons, uh, testicular cancer um, development later on. Um, but um, you know, I think I think it, it has to be addressed. Yeah. So how I've done these when I don't have access to lap, um, I make a fan and seal incision. Okay. And for a prune belly kiddo, I would put a bladder catheter in the urethra. Now they can be very challenging to catheterize because of how dilated and saccular that urethra is but usually you have a fairly large bladder such that even if you percutaneously drained it, right? So if you're going, if you're going in through a fan and steel incision, you'll probably hit the bladder first. Um, you could okay. aspirate that and drain it completely um, if you can't get a bladder catheter in to get it out of your way. Um, okay. And then it's pretty nice because these are super stretchy abdominal walls. So with a few Diva retractors, you're going to be able to find these testes. You can actually get up to um, the psoas muscle, um, even oh. through a fan and steel, especially in a kiddo this young. And then I end up in the, the same way you would do a Fowler-Stevens and, and, or even a primary lap orchiopexy, you know how you're tunneling the new tract over the pubic symphysis, you create the same exact tract. So right between um, your superior epigastrics and your um, medial umbilical ligament, you just create a tract over this, the pubic symphysis straight down into the scrotum. So you can do the whole surgery through a fan and steel. Okay, okay. Yeah, in fact, when I was planning for that surgery, I was thinking that uh, I was going to use a lower midline incision uh, because I was thinking that this bladder was going to be a difficult one to manage. <laughs> so, uh, but if, and considering that I thought catheterizing this child was virtually impossible, uh, so I couldn't collapse the bladder and uh, get it out of my way. So I said, no, um, if I was going to, then a lower midline is probably, uh, but I don't know, maybe I can look at this one too. My concern was how to get the bladder to collapse and out of the way uh, so that I can work freely. But you are, yeah. you are just saying that even with the fan steel, I can aspirate. I Absolutely. didn't think about it that way. Yeah, it's, it's right there. It. It's right in your way. So you can just aspirate yes. it. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. And then many of these are quite high. And so you would end up having to do a one stage Fowler Stevens. Um, I okay. wouldn't want to go back and, and do two stages through a fan and steel. I would, it wouldn't All be right. ideal. Okay. All right. Um, so I think uh, I would talk. To the family again, and yes. Can I, can I ask a question? Oh, sure. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, what is your experience with uh, doing vesicostomy uh, for these food delicates? The first I do, I have incomplete painting. Um, significant um, residual urine at the 
and it, uh, we use vesicles for me before, and um, if you use vesicles for me, when would you want to close it up? I think it's, it's hard to do vesicostomies in these patients because they tend to prolapse because you just don't get, um, you just don't have that abdominal wall that you're able to um, you know, support your vesicostomy through. Um, so that's, that's a big challenge. And because the bladders are so floppy as well, they don't, you know, they don't tend even with the vesicostomy, they, they still sometimes still drainage issues related to that. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Janelle, it's just, you know, it's hard. Yeah, it's not ever a perfect solution. So I think the, the moral of the story with prune belly syndrome is because the muscle is abnormal and you can never make it normal, you're never going to make this kid void normally. Um, the best thing to do is to observe them until they have problems that force your hand to do something surgical. So, uh, you know, we really try to avoid doing a vesicostomy or an APV unless we absolutely have to. So if a child's getting febrile UTIs and they're bumping off their kidneys um, and they're not voiding enough, so they're voiding very small amounts, but they're retaining most of it, then you may have to do something. But a vesicostomy would be what you would choose in the, the diaper age kid or the very young child until they're old enough to catheterize. And they often have trouble catheterizing their urethra because of that saccular dilation. So that's when appendico vesicostomies might be needed. I can count on one hand the number of prune belly kids I've seen with any of those reconstructions. Most of them, we really prefer to let them pee on their own and accept that they're not going to empty perfectly. Yeah, I, I, I think that, um, as you said, if there is no urethral obstruction and the child can void somewhat, then if he's not getting febrile UTIs, uh, it is just good to just watch them so long as they can void something out. Because uh, I think that as they grow, they even void better. And uh, rather than go ahead and do a vesicostomy, uh, you watch them. Unless probably there is a visceral obstruction and they can't void anything at all. Or maybe there is a febrile UTI or he's having some other serious complications. I think it's always best to watch them. And many of them do get UTIs but many are not compliant with peeing very frequently because their bladder is so large that they wait all day long to go. And so you really have to take a thoughtful history to make sure that they're voiding often, even if they do not have to, and they're trying to pee twice. Um, because if left to their own devices, they won't ever feel like they have to urinate. Thank you. Uh, Janelle. Yes. Uh, Daniel, if mm -hmm. you can share with us your experience, if you have seen any of such children grow up <coughs> into adulthood, what are some of the problems apart from the sexual dysfunction? Uh, do they really grow into adulthood? Is it compatible with normal life to a very adult age? And when they grow into adulthood, what are the issues that bother them the most, apart from the sexual function? Thank you. Danielle, do you want to? Sure. I mean, I've had a few um, patients of mine that um, probably followed them into their early to mid 20s, and then they sometimes then kind of get lost to follow up and, or we transition them over to adult urology, but no, they, there are, um, you know, prune belly ex um, exists on a spectrum. And so, you know, certainly I think some who have more of the milder presentations of it certainly live into adulthood and, and can lead fairly normal lives. I think, you know, urinary tract infections and issues with um, bladder emptying are lifelong. Those are not things that necessarily, you know, significantly improve as they get older. 
Um, and so I think those are sort of the chronic issues that we continue to deal with is making sure that they are emptying, um, you know, um, the point of time voiding, like Janelle talked about, making sure that they're going on regular intervals. I think those are always things that we battle a little bit. Um, and then, you know, the sexual dysfunction part um, is, is, is always an issue, it certainly is into adulthood. Um, you know, I, we usually would, you know, as a pediatric urologist, we, we would typically refer them over, you know, if it was a pressing issue and they really wanted to explore other options, we would refer them over to some of our um, sexual uh, medicine colleagues. Um, but, you know, a lot of them definitely had issues with, um, you know, er um, erectile dysfunction. Um, you know, so it, it could be challenging, but they, but at the same token, uh, you know, a lot of them were leading very, you know, productive lives as, as young adults. Yeah. Um, Thank you. And I, I've um, seen a very rare female prune belly. It is possible. I think it's about one in three to 500,000. It's very, very, very rare. Um, so I, I've seen one and she did not have any reproductive tract issues and lived a pretty normal life. Um, all of the boys that I've seen have had infertility. I've never seen a prune belly man have his own children. Um, and I don't know how much of that is the fertility component versus the sexual, um, the erectile component. So that's a little mm. bit tough for us to tease out is pediatric urologists, but I think most of these men do have infertility long-term. Hmm. Okay, so uh, Dr. Animakum Watson has joined us, has okay. even asked a question. Uh, he's a pediatric urologist at Confanochi Teaching Hospital. And they first managed the first case, mm -hmm. and he's here to help us uh, with a bit of the history, and so that we, we can have a fruitful discussion on the first case. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so um, so this kid had the, um, he had an erectile malformation at birth, and then it, it, during the, when we were constructing the uh, colostomy, uh, we realized that we couldn't pass the catheter. So, so we uh, we created a vesicostomy for him, um, and later on, we wanted to find out what was really happening, and that's when we did uh, the contrast study for. And when we created the contrast study, we we saw that there was a little bit um, dilatation of posterior urethra. And there's nothing seems to be passing through the anterior urethra. Some thin stream was coming through that. And it was not uh, easy to open it out. So we wanted to create a fistulous tract between um, at the perineum to be able to help him train. Um, initially, we, we, we thought it comes a little more to the anterior urethra. So we were fully that up to open, but we didn't get much urine coming through that. And therefore, we wanted to go to the perineum. I think we didn't end up doing that. We, we stopped and kept the um, this, uh, the vesicostomy that was created at birth. And then um, we contacted Dr. He was very good with this contraction of the urethra to see the way forward. But it's a nice kid that had an erectile malformation with a kind of urethra to easier. Of the anterior urethra, with some uh, dilatation you know, uh, of the um, uh, uh, posterior urethra. And um, it wasn't the, um, the constricted section was not because of the pull through for a retinal malformation, but it was an attractive pain at birth. We had these bulbous and kidneys that didn't have anything like an erectile uh, tissue. It's as if it's only the sponge tissue that you can feel in there. And um, it was huge and big. Um, from me, I, I was trying to get one of my, my fellows to give, send me an image, but he's not around. 
Um, we had some few images of it in the beginning on the site when that it could have shared. But we thought that procedure that the patient could be open up so that the kit we can uh, the vesicostomy can be avoided or can be closed or can be stopped so that the kid can drink from there and we take our time for the child to grow. I think that's if that is the information and the time is it is it okay? Does it provide enough information of what you needed? Daniel. <clears throat> yes. Mm. I think there are some of the questions you asked me. I couldn't provide you answers. Yes. Uh, are the answers enough for you? But mm -hmm. Dr. Nimakun, the question I would like to find out from you is, did this boy have, uh, how did the boy then pass urine in utero? And how was the boy able to survive to birth if this is what he had? Was there any communication between the posterior urethra and the rectum, uh, which may have allowed him to be passing urine uh, little by little per the feces? So um, it's possible because the kid had an erectile malformation. I've forgotten the exact type but it's most likely it's going to be the rectal urethra kind of type. And I'm very sure they might be commenting there, but if you look at the, uh, at the image, the MCUG, you see that there's a thin stream of urine that seems to be able to pass through that anterior urethra, but was it enough for the kid to completely empty? I think we saw, uh, when we tried to um, go, we saw that there was a... Hello, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. yes, actually, if I may come in at this point, at okay. the time of the reconstruction, I saw that he had no meatus. Actually, from the uh, point where the contrast gets to, to the very tip of the penis, you should count about 0 0.5 centimeters of blind ending tissue. There was no urethra towards the towards the the very tip of the penis, and so in the first, in the second film you realize that I used buccal mucosa, a tunnel buccal mucosa through uh, that dead tissue to come to the tip and did the myotoplasty for him. And so I would be very surprised if the urine at all. Uh, even in utero, he was able to pee through the meatus. I'm very surprised. Yes, that's what I'm saying that uh, um, I wish that I could have gotten them to, but they are all not available uh, to get the mm. image for the anorectal malformation. But it's most likely oh, that... What's up? Yeah, I don't know. Okay, Davo. Okay, um, Dr. Okay, Davo is here. Yeah, okay. So, good evening to everyone. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Yes, good evening. So, I think he had the um, ARM with the rectal bladder, um, bladder neck fistula. Okay, Danielle, can you skip forward to the next, um, the next cystogram that was done after his urethral reconstruction? Because mm -hmm. that nicely demonstrates where the um, high imperforate anus had its rectourethral fistula. Mm -hmm. So that little out pouching off of the prosthetic urethra is the remnant of the rectourethral fistula, um, which also suggests a very high imperforate anus since the insertions above the pelvic floor. Yeah, so um, intra will be found it was a ARM with a rectal bladder neck fistula. And then with a the question Dr. He was asking about how the child was voiding. I think at birth, what we noticed was that, in fact, initially we thought the child had a macrophallus, that the penis was big. Um, but when you palpate, it was just very flabby, it was very soft and flabby. You couldn't palpate any penile tissue in there. So our initial suspicion was that the child had a urethral um, diverticulum or something. So that was because it was quite, the order you could see was a very big looking phallus. But when you palpate, you couldn't feel any penile tissue but just uh, what seemed to be the foreskin at the time, we thought it was 
uh, urethral diverticulum. So what I think we lost audio. Yeah. Yes, I think we lost audio, but then I think that information about him being um, a bladder and neck fistula is um, a bit helpful, but um, still not conclusive about how the case survived in the Ukraine. But I'm very sure there was an easy journey through the um, because the connection between the bladder and and the um, and the rectum in those kind of cases is very wide and it can allow a lot of drainage. So maybe the back pressure could have been passing through that. But uh, this is what we did have in there. Um, we don't think that um, thing that looked like a, the roof is actually the roof, but I mean, the, the reconstruction that was done and maybe a little bit of it was uh, that Proximal part of the dilated portion could not be seen at the time of surgery. We don't have intra intra um, intra op imaging, so sometimes we're limited about the place that you can see. Um, because imaging intra op could have helped us to identify the end of whatever is left. But what if it was a bladder neck fistula, as you say, then we are expecting to be more proximal the connection to a bit more prosmond than that. And I don't know whether you have any experience with any anything like that you try to use at that point in system the key. Um, I also I'm looking forward to Dr. Dabo rejoining us on call. But I don't know whether the information is provided is enough. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want me to go to, this is one of the intraoperative pictures? That's right. Okay. So, so. the ch child looks like he has a pretty normal phallus. Where, where was the original stenotic urethra inserting? Where did it open? I think that's what you see in the image in the I don't know. I don't know. Did you see anything else when you try to see the phallus? When you look at the phallus, it looks like it's a normal looking phallus, but it is just not hanging on anything. It just hangs around like a bag. There was nothing. Okay, so that's yeah. what it was only the sponge tissue because the glands was there, but you can't find any erectile tissue apart from the, um, the sponge tissue. Yeah, okay. So you're right. Um, before we get to the, the that film that shows the surgery, can you go back to the can you go back to the second uh, contrast right study, please? Mm -hmm. This one. The contrast study. Or uh, the first one. This this study or see. this one. No, the second, the second one, yeah. The second one. Not this okay. one, the second one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, intra op at the first uh, surgery, you realize that the, the, the urethra was very atretic. It felt very hard, very hard and stenotic. And so I, we, I had to remove that entire length of the urethra that was completely stenosed. And then we put in a baca mucosa uh, on the dorsal aspects, and then put in um, a skin flap. So we did a double substitution, neutroplasty. And you can see uh, this post of film shows that we have been able to narrow the gap between the uh, initial repair, initial film where you found that the urethra was almost completely atretic 
to now a very short segment where you have a very tiny streak of contrast passing through. So, and the second surgery, we decided that because this one, there's redundancy in the ureter. And so, although you see that on this form, it looks like the, the, the area of narrowing was about, uh, about a centimeter or two, we thought that we could still be able to do anastomotic retroplasty. And that's what we have in the next film, if you can look at it. Mm -hmm. I don't think no. we have no. that picture. We only have Not that two one. Pictures. Let's go to the, that's right. I agree with you. The surgical one. The surgical. Oh, the surgical picture. The okay. surgical. That's this right. One? That's right. Okay. This one. So, this one. So, so for this one, we, we were able to research the area of narrowing and do an astomotic urethroplasty for him. Um, beyond that, after you remove the catheter, the patient could still not be voiding. The patient could still not void. And that's when I had to reach out to you, uh, mm -hmm. Daniel mm -hmm. and uh, that, uh, Dr. Fox. That's the point at which we had to reach out to you to find out whether we had any experience with such a case as to how we can manage the posterior urethra. Because our, our thinking now is that because of the tortuosity and the very dilated nature of the posterior urethra, that's why it's still not voiding and not necessarily from anastomotic site stenosis. Thank you. And have you imaged the urethra a third time after you did this procedure? Um, yes, uh, by the time I was sending you these ones, mm -hmm. we had not done the film, but we've done it. Uh, unfortunately, when they brought it to us, as soon, uh, uh, soon after you removed the catheter and you couldn't pee, we took another film, mm -hmm. but uh, they, they, they took it away in my absence. The resident allowed them to take it away because the woman was like, if they don't take the film back to the, the father, he may think that they had deceived him in taking money to do this uh, contrast study when they really they didn't do any contrast study. So mm -hmm. I was really pissed off when I came and I, the resident had allowed her to take the film away without taking a picture of it. So I must say that I don't have that picture as of now, but what I saw the anastomotic site was 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 perfect. Yeah. Okay. So so it was open. It wasn't strictured. Yes, it was open. Okay. Okay. So I mean, I. I think that there's two important things that we have not yet ruled out that um, can happen with imperforate anus and also influence voiding. So the first and the most common would be a tethered cord. So that posterior urethra may be dilated because there's detrusor sphincter dyssynergy and the child cannot void normally because the spinal cord is tethered. That happens in about 25% of imperforate anus children, and it's far more common with a high imperforate anus. Um, well, we know this child has a high imperforate anus because the rectourethral fistula is above the urogenital diaphragm. So it's within the prosthetic urethra. The lower imperforate anuses will have rectobulbar or rectoperineal fistulae. And those are the ones with better prognosis for fecal and urinary continence. So I, I think it's a little challenging because how we look for a tethered cord is going to be to do an MRI of the spine. Um, a CT won't tell you. So I don't, unfortunately, I don't know if we'll know that. Um, now, the other thing we haven't really ruled out that does happen at the level of the membranous urethra and can extend into the bulbar urethra is posterior urethral valves. This would be very rare in association with um, other distal urethral anomalies. 
but I have seen it in children with imperforate anus. So you would just wanna make sure that the membranous urethra is normal and doesn't have valvular tissue. Um, I, I almost wonder with how stenotic that urethra is that you describe whether this was a urethral duplication and the actual native urethra was going into the rectum, whereas the dorsal urethra was what you saw that was severely stenotic and that's never a functional urethra. Um, it doesn't usually go through the urethral sphincter. So um, that, that we would only have been able to determine with um, a BCUG study, I think before reconstruction. So, I mean, we're a little stuck because we're really just relying on the child to urinate as our, our litmus test to see if he has the capability of doing so or not. And if he doesn't void, I think you're then looking at a vesicostomy or some sort of diversion. Um, do you have the ability to get an MRI? Is that feasible at all? <laughs> yes, yes, we can very, do MRI. Very, very feasible. Okay, all right. Well, that would be my next step. So I would do cystoscopy and then I would also do an MRI of the spine. Danielle, what do you think? No, I mean, I think those are, you know, I, I think those are exactly right. Um, right path to take. I think at this point, it's a little, the picture is still not completely clear. Um, and so I think you have to rule out some of those obvious, you know, of, you know, functional obstruction like posterior urethral valves or um, something more neurogenic um, like a tethered cord. I think those are the other two things. So yeah, I think those, I think you would have to eliminate the possibility of those two before, um, you know, before moving forward. I think you're going to find a tethered cord in this child. That's going to be my prediction. Um, and then you're so, pretty so well limited to vesicostomy. Would you, um, at this age, would you, is this group recommend us doing a mitral follow? Or you not, think we should not in this age. Back? Yeah, not, not in really, this I age. I think it should be like four years now, uh, something like that. It's still very young. Um, he's not yeah. going to be able to catheterize himself and his parents will have a challenging time at the age of four. Just having had two four-year-olds, I can't imagine pinning them down and starting intermittent catheterization at four as opposed to having started it when he was an infant. Um, it's a different, it's kind of a different animal. You know, if you start catheterizing a kid at the school ages versus getting used to it in the infancy years. It's, it's a whole lot easier in the infancy years to start. So usually we would do a vesicostomy until they can catheterize their vesicostomy and show that they're cooperative with it. And then once you can demonstrate a child's cooperative with having their belly catheterized, then you can do the appendical vesicostomy. And that, that would be what age would you be doing that appendical vesicostomy? When he's mature no, enough. So the, the reason I'm asking this is that, that the reason I'm saying is that um, the stomach in that in the environment is not well accepted, uh, especially when they have to wear that dress for a long time. And uh, from my own estimate, I'm mean, thinking that by five years, since the kid is in diapers, um, we might not even. Uh, get them to come back or they will come and not be happy with anything they do. Um, our people don't take stomachs easily, um, commonly. And uh, see the frustration in this mother and wanting the kid to void from there. From whatever we have seen and the results of the good reconstruction, we know that it cannot void through that. And definitely we cannot do a CIC through that because of the reconstructed nature of it. We like it to not get it and uh, compliance from the, the parents. So um, it, they've been able to, we do have two nurses in a way who can help us. Um, CIC might not come handy, even CIC is sort of important for the part of the process. That's why I was thinking that we, we still have some kind of direction for the mali, hey, uh, the bladder, if we can, if it's possible for us to, we do a, 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 um, a appendicular custom area. Yeah. 
Thank you. That was where I was coming from. Um, the only problem with an appendicovesicostomy now is that if he doesn't use it, you've lost your last channel and it will stenose. So in my experience in the child who is not yet ready to use it or to do CIC, um, it's more of a problem to just try it and see if they're ready than it is to do the vesicostomy, prove that they're ready to catheterize something and then go in and do the APV. Danielle, do you have anything to add to that? No, I, I totally agree. I think if you do it too early, it really can have some catastrophic implications down the road. You know, it's a tough surgery to recover from. Um, and I think if the timing isn't right, you, you really, it, it can be quite difficult. Um, you know, uh, patients, if they're not compliant, um, you know, the chances of them wanting to go through the whole procedure again, if it's that's even a possibility is, is low. Um, and so I think you really, if you do it too soon, um, it really, the kids are kind of worse off for it. So you, you, you recommend that you go back and uh, refashion the vesicostomy and make it a bit more trainable so that they can live with that for, for a while? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would give this child a vesicostomy first, if you, especially if you find a tethered cord, right? Um, if he has a suprapubic tube right now, you can certainly leave that in and do his work up. But if you find a tethered cord, he's not going to void normally. Um, do your neurosurgeons do detethering procedures? Yeah, yeah, they can't be, be, they will be able to do that, yeah. So then you could always have him detethered and see if he is able to start voiding spontaneously. Um, the suprapubic tube just gets exchanged every six weeks in the meantime. Dr. Sweeney, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you look at the contrast film mm -hmm. for after the first uh, surgery, you can put them together side by side. Mm -hmm. If if uh, are you not bothered by the redundancy of the posterior urethra, and if you are, if we were to go mm -hmm. for it, what would be some of your mm -hmm. tips and tricks for this one? Because when I went in there, I I thought I had resected enough only to come uh, to repeat the film uh, to see the, the, this uh, very redundant posterior urethra. Mm -hmm. How do you really tackle this uh, problem? Or is it not necessary to really go for the redundant area? Well, I think you have to figure out why it's redundant first. So if, you know, if the child has a tethered cord um, and this is um, neurogenic cause to why the, you know, why the posterior urethra is so dilated, you can't surgically fix that. That's not something that you can resect. Um, if it's posterior urethral valves, um, I, I, that might be, it, it could be very kind of technically challenging. Do you, do you guys have a small pediatric resectoscope or a pediatric scope? Yeah, we do. We do have the smallest pediatroscope. We have a size six French mm -hmm. that we use for the neonates. Okay. Um, but we're not thinking that this kid might have a while because of the attractive nature of the whole thing. And um, looking at the redundancy of the posterior urethra and the fact that there are no contracted tissues and the penis is a big bubble, so I'm not surprised that it's difficult for them to avoid because the penis is just hanging like a bag by the side mm -hmm. of the of the of the of the, uh, the PB bone. And I mean, I know the parents have asked me before that there's possibility of this and I, I was blunt about not having anything there. It just hangs. Mm -hmm. That's all. So, um, we, uh, PUV is very, very low on our list in this mm -hmm. case. Uh, we can still um, put the scope in and have a look. We have very, very small scopes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. I would say, you know, if you want to just kind of, you know, even not necessarily even looking at bells, if you wanted to visualize it, I think it would be very hard to, to do cystoscopy on this child. I mean, you could, if the vesicostomy is in place, you can um, approach it in a retrograde fashion. That's definitely hard to do with a rigid scope. Um, do you have flexible scopes available? No, 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 no. We do no have flexible. rigid scopes. It's just all no, rigid. Yeah. Okay. So that, that yeah. kind of limits you a little bit if you're not able to um, get access to it. But again, I think, you know, I, I agree with Janelle. I think the likelihood that this child has an, you know, tethered cord is, is probably the number one thing on your list. And there's really, unfortunately, not a surgical fix to that. Um, and so there's not anything you can do to make, if it's a tethered cord, there's not a, a surgical procedure that you can make the urethra less redundant and um, dilated. So with tethered cord, yeah. the classic okay. te the classic teaching with tethered cord is that a third get better, a third stay the same, and a third get worse after the detether, and that's with respect to their bladders. So you cannot promise the family that this child will definitely be voiding and that the bladder contraction will coincide with sphincter relaxation because that's the pathology. It's detrusor sphincter dyssynergy that happens with a tethered cord. So that membranous sphincter is just not relaxing at the time the bladder is contracting, which causes that dilation in the posterior urethra. But that may or may not get better after a cord detethering. Yes, understood. Um, yeah. I agree with you, yeah. It's a tough so case. I think, yeah, that's, that it is, and both. Um, so I think, yeah, I think the next step really would be an MRI um, to assess the tether core issue. And then, you know, maybe get back with us, maybe after you get that test done, um, you can let us know what the results are and we can kind of then walk through, you know, perhaps what the next step should be. I mean, obviously if it's tethered, referral to your neurosurgery colleagues. Um, but then from there, to sort of how do you how do you manage this child who you know is going to be difficult? You're not going to be able to cap. He's not going to be a child that can be catheterized. And so you know, what's the best way to manage that going forward? Now, um, when imperforate anus is recognized under four to six months of age, a child can still have an ultrasound of their spinal cord. So I guess in the really young ones that come to you early, you can get an ultrasound, which might save them needing an MRI. Um, that's part of our workup, right? So part of the workup for any child with imperforate anus should be a kidney ultrasound, a VCUG, um, an ultrasound of the spine, and then whatever else our pediatric surgery colleagues recommend for the anus which is typically the diverting colostomy with the anti-grade um, colostogram. And then Bacterol okay. and Botter are other concerns. So. All right. Well, That's thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, definitely keep us posted on the results of this. We'd love to hear um, you know, going forward, how these patients are doing and, um, you know, how they, how you guys have been managing them and um, their, their path forward. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. great cases. Per perfect. Thank cases you very much. Yes. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you very much for sharing with us. Great. Well, Thank keep you. the cases coming. Yeah. Just, you know, anytime you want to, you know, you have a few patients that you have, um, collected and want some opinions on it, let us know. Um, we're happy to put together a panel to, to walk, you know, walk through them and review them. Thank That's you so much. We will do that. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Very, very All right. Yes. yes. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Good evening. Yes, have a good night. Okay. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.